I am Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. Now that's a countdown you haven't heard in a while. The cleave is in the the original countdown. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He Man, taught I us, get to say, uh, get us out of here clean today. You, you can, yeah, you know. He was the Look, original guy. He looks guy. so comfortable over yeah. there in all the in the driver's seat, Mister Producer Man. Well, you know, he had an evil Knievel accident last week. Yeah, That's he's been into the was. motorcycles. Yeah, <laughs> I think he broke up, uh, like chipped a piece of his back. Seat. Yeah, he tore got himself on. up. Yeah, impression fracture. Just yeah. so glad evil you're Knievel. here and getting better. He's in a yeah. chair with a broken back. A mini bike accident. Uh, it hurt me to watch him. It I hurt like me to, to watch him walk last week. I like to tell people motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> so you Come were on, like, Bobby. you were like, "Hey kids, this is how you do it." Yeah. And then you ran into the side of the house or something. Now it's my turn. <laughs> Everything with Bobby remotes back to comedy. So he's envisioning you in a scene from like Dumb and Dumber or something like oh, that. Clearly, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a moped. Sorry, Cleveland. It we was love a you. motorbike. We're glad you're on the mend. Like my grandmother used to tell me, you'll be all right when you quit hurting. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> oh, that that sounds like a Mr. Foxism right there. <laughs> all right, guys. So here's what we're going to do today. This is uh, the bonus episode. Real excited about it. Looking around, we got Dudley sitting here. We got Lanny, Toxie's down there at the end of the table. On the couch, we've got Mr. Ed Sanders, a legendary local gunsmith who's been gunsmithing 63 years. Man. Sitting Ooh. next to him. What? Yep. There, there they are. Ones, yep. Sitting next to him, we got Brooks White, who's grand. He's a grandson to Mr. Sanders. Yep. Taking over the gunsmithing business, and uh, he's been an apprentice for twenty years. Lanny, I think he's about ready to start doing it. Yeah, on, yeah, yeah. Figure years. out by now. <laughs> and then through the magic of Zoom, we've got a guy that's going to add to the conversation, Pat. Epling and our very own. He, I mean, he knows more about. You know how you buy a gun? It's I love the guns now that are dipped. Oh yeah. You know, and, and I mean, if you're going to buy a gun to hunt with, that's what you need. No doubt about it. And Pack, he knows more about how to do that and how to take care of that than anybody else on the planet. Well, he knows a lot about firearms too. I swear, every every trade show I go to, he comes to me and asks me tree questions, and I always respond with with firearm questions. So. He's a, he's, a, he's a virtual guy. encyclopedia, that's for sure. Yeah. Now, did we hit the horns for Pat? I want to make sure we treat everybody even. That's here. right. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate that. His mustache alone deserves the horns. Uh, he's got quite a mustache. Yeah, I see that. So before we get started, though, so I'm kind of in my mind thinking this is a, is a maintenance podcast. So before you put your gun up, whether it's a shotgun or rifle, what do you need to do to it? But before we go down this road, our friend... Dr. Ned Miller here locally. He is the doctor to Toxie, Mr. Fox, the Hayes family. All of us. He's all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we all. My, we all he's go my down. doctor. Yeah, we all go down. The there, good right? doctor. He is a. He's so smart. You could. Well, you could easily say there's a number of us that might not even be here today without him, and you can throw me in that. Uh, his dad right saved my life. That too. Yep. Yeah, Doctor Ed. Really, really interesting. Just a don't get me started. Important part of our community. Absolutely. So the other day I asked him, you know, if you think about turkey season, I'm looking at Mr. Ed. Don't go to sleep on us now. No, no. Okay. All right. So I, I, you think about turkey season, guys, and you lose Lanny. I'm talking now. Would I'm you listening. Pay attention I'm looking to over there, Richie. Talking. We're working through some things. <laughs> so uh, if you go through turkey season. Let's just say you go four mornings a week. And you lose three hours of sleep each one of those mornings. Mm-hmm. And this goes on for, say, five weeks. Are you doing math again? I'm not doing it in my head, but that's a lot of hours. <laughs> that's a lot of hours that you lose. So I asked Ned, how can we – is there anything that we can do to help ourselves during turkey season not be so drowsy or, or, or to, to be healthier? Yeah. And Ned uh, – so, he's so busy, he couldn't come in here and talk about this, but he recorded something for us, and I want everybody to listen to it. Oh, cool. Let's go. Hey, guys. I appreciate y'all having me on again. And that's a great question, Bobby. Uh, but before we talk about how you pay off a sleep debt, I want to back up and talk about sleep in general for a second. 
Uh, so just to illustrate how important sleep is, I wanted to point out a few facts. And the first is the one we've all heard. Um, but just to remind you, you know, if you're, if you go 20 to 24 hours without sleep, your brain is in a state similar to if you have an elevated blood alcohol level and that'll manifest itself as, uh, increased reaction times and decreased coordination, et cetera. Um, but I think a better way to, to illustrate just how important sleep is, is this, um, your body can go for much longer without food than it can without sleep. You know, there's reports of people doing water fasts for weeks at a time, and some fasting may even be healthy, but going without sleep for weeks will kill you. Uh, so that's how important sleep is. Um, you know, and in order to, to pay off a sleep debt, it's also important to be able to recognize the symptoms of sleep debt, and, and those symptoms can be very subtle. Um, when I'm talking with patients about the recognition of the cognitive fatigue that is caused by sleep debt, I like to try and contrast the symptoms of cognitive fatigue to the symptoms of physical fatigue. So if you go run a mile, your heart rate's going to be up, your legs are going to be tired, you may be sweating, you may even be panting. And those symptoms are readily recognizable as physical fatigue. But when it comes to cognitive fatigue, uh, that accompanies sleep debt, the symptoms are much more subtle. So you might think about how you feel at the end of a long day of work or maybe the long week of work. Uh, you might feel sluggish. You might feel not so mentally sharp. You may be irritable. You may even have a headache. Uh, maybe you're not even looking forward to getting up and going turkey hunting on Saturday if it's close to the end of the season, you know. Uh, and it's that loss of motivation and headache and irritability and foggy cognition that are the signs of short-term sleep deprivation or sleep debt. And that's your brain's way of telling you that it needs to, to get some rest so it can repair and rebuild itself. That, that headache, irritability, foggy cognition, and loss of motivation, that is your brain's version of panting. So, so now that we know the, the signs of short-term sleep deprivation or sleep debt, uh, let's talk about how you can recognize just how much debt you're carrying. So uh, early on in the development of that sleep debt, um, those symptoms that we talked about may not occur until 9 or 10 p.m. But as that debt continues to compound, you might notice that the symptoms start to occur earlier and earlier and earlier in the day. And say, uh, by the end of turkey season come 9 a.m., you might be uh, falling asleep against that oak tree. Uh, and again, that is your brain's version of panting. Um, now, back to your original question, you know, when it comes to paying that debt, um, you don't have to pay it back hour for hour, but the bill does come due, uh, and that just depends on how the debt was accumulated. I have a lot of patients in my practice who are shift workers, and they may work seven on, seven off type shifts, and, and during their seven on, they may be working 12-hour shifts. So by the end of a seven-day stretch of 12-hour shifts, they're pretty exhausted. And in this case, just getting an extra hour or two of sleep for two to three days in a row may alleviate those symptoms and and get people back to normal. I know you guys experience something similar when you go to trade shows and you're working late into the evening, maybe into the wee hours of the morning, and then getting up and doing it again for multiple days in a row. And by the end of the show, you may experience those symptoms that we talked about. And in those cases, an extra hour or two of sleep a day for two or three days typically gets you fully recovered. You know, alternatively, if a sleep debt is accrued in a shorter time frame, then it has to be repaid in a shorter time frame. As a, for instance, prior to medical school, I worked as an EMT and we worked 24 hours on and 48 hours off. And during the 24 hour shifts, they may run over a little bit and we might go 20 or 30 hours without sleep. And because that debt was accumulated so quickly, um, it needed to be paid off very quickly. And, and after a 24 to 30 hour shift without sleep, uh, I might crash and sleep for 12 hours at a time. And I still see a lot of medics in my practice today, and, and they all universally describe that same phenomena of crashing after a rapidly accumulated sleep debt. Um, and, and that's their brain's way of making them pay that debt so they can get back to normal. So, so yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I hope that, that uh, sheds some light on that. And uh, it, it's something we're all going to experience at some point in our lives. And, and if you can recognize it and figure out how it occurred, then you can know sort of what to expect and, and how to repay that debt. So, so again, thanks for the invite. 
uh, love being on the show. And, uh, you know, I can't uh, come on the show and not leave you with a dad joke. So here goes. <laughs> what do you call it when your feet go to sleep and won't wake up? Comatose. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I wish I could be in there. I would so call it. You can put that one in the book. That's, That's a Bob joke. I appreciate it, guys. I look joke. forward to talking to you all soon. Yeah. Bye. All right. He's so smart. I, I just enjoyed listening to him, talking to him. But, that, gosh, I mean, we've all been there. We've all leaned against a tree on, in the morning and just kind of catnapped a little bit. It's I mean, just <clears throat> when I learned that I have sleep issues, he helps me with. And it's better, but it's not great. But, um. If you just start looking at all the terrible things that could happen to you in life, you know, disease-wise, whether it be heart disease or cancer or some of the big ones, it's like number one cause of all of them is lack of sleep. More than whatever, smoking or anything, the most unhealthy thing you can do is not have good sleep habits. The most important thing to do to live a long, healthy life is having good sleep habits. Now, there's a lot more, obviously, but it's just, you know, I grew up, eight foot tall and bulletproof I could get up and come to work at two in the morning I thought I was really doing something and you know kind of driven and whatever you know I was too much stuff going on in my mind or get up early I mean we all need to pay attention to it, it's the bottom line yeah mm -hmm. sure do can't and we ignore it and I, I mean I will say this just to say because I know so many devoutly honorable men especially but men and women both that will just forego their own sleep Ah, I'm a tough guy, you know, I don't need it. And they're just wrong, all of you. Pay attention, take care of yourself. I want everybody out there too. So thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. yeah. So important. Well, during turkey season, it seems like it kind of compounds itself around, oh, around gosh, here yeah. for us. See these people? When the clock strikes five, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. They have to do these things. They have to do those things. Enter the all-new LS Tractor MT2 and MT2E, a relentless force of innovation, redesigned with a new hood and cab built for comfort and visibility, with enhanced lifting capacity to get the job done, making these people the ones everyone else calls those people. Visit your local LS Tractor dealer today. Moultrie has pioneered the game management category. Today, Moultrie is one of the best-selling brands of feeders and seeders in the world, and they continue to innovate with new technology that gamekeepers will rely on. Moultrie products are always field-tested and designed for hunters by hunters, combining forward-thinking innovation with time-tested practicality. Moultrie, first in feeders since 1979. All right, so guys, Moultrie is offering our listeners a 15% site-wide discount at MoultrieFeeders.com. Use the code Mossy Oak with a capital M, Mossy Oak, at MoultrieFeeders.com and get that 15% discount. Lanny, what you, you're looking at me like. Oh, no, I was just listening to you. Yeah, so I, I slept really good last night. So. Yeah. Well, you don't look as tired as you did at the beginning of the week. <laughs> and you never did hand me your Alabama turkey. You just let it just go with... You usually just take the turkeys. I well, you can't, I, I trying you to can't hand off a turkey. Yeah, Thank you. You yeah. can't just do that, Bobby. <clears throat> I mean, I've, have you ever handed one off? No. Ever? Uh, no. Well, no. no. But, but there's a first time for yeah, everything. Yeah, That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let's get back focusing. Okay, so guys, let's think about this. Tur so, it's boy, you guys up north, y'all are, are still hunting, and, oh, but, but y'all can pay attention to this. But so now where we are, Turkey season has ended. Deer season has officially started. Mm -hmm. And we're going to lay is. our shotguns in our saves or, or in the corner. But Not our rifles. One but, more as uh, we have squirrel season. Well, that's true. Yep. 22's out. So I want to look at uh, Mr. Ed and ask him, and Brooks too. So what is what can we do to what, – what do, how do we need to treat our shotguns and our rifles when the season's over? Well, you know, if you've got one that has the uh, – uh, the, uh, applied finish. You have to be careful what kind of what you use on it to clean it. Uh, if you got one with the blued finish, you want to be sure and rub that thing down with uh, with an oily cloth. Yes, sir. To, to keep the rust out, because the high carbon steel they'll rust fast. You also need to wipe the swab out the chamber and the barrel. If that's all you can, if that's all you're capable of doing, then. And, and it needs a, a thorough cleaning, 
which is a good idea if you've used it a good bit. Not as much turkey hunting as it would be duck hunting, where you shoot a lot. Yes, sir. But they, if you do that, they need to need to be serviced. I mean, you service your your truck, your lawnmower, everything else. A gun needs to be serviced too. Uh, some people don't think about that, and forget about that, and then they get a big chance and it lets them down. Yeah, uh, I've heard that before. Yeah, mm. we have uh, we've run into rifles that a fella had a, almost a new rifle, high dollar rifle now, not a cheapy. And uh, he got a shot at a trophy deer, and it snapped on him. And he is bad upset. I understand that. <laughs> well, we found rust inside a boat now. We found rust. We found old grease that had got gummy. All kind of things. A little piece of trash. So when we clean a rifle, we take it, strip it all the way down, take the bolt apart, Wash everything and inspect it. Lube it and put it back together. So, you know, it's necessary to do these things. Also, uh, I think Brooks will agree with this. You, uh, your shotgun or your rifle, when you dump the season, be sure it's empty and drop your firing pin, dry fire it. I've always the, wondered that. Take that, that tension off the spring. That's exactly <laughs> right. Hmm. We find them that, uh, a guy says, I've had a little misfire problem with this. The firing pin's okay. And we'll take that thing out and the main spring is three quarters of an inch shorter than it should be. Now that spring is taking set. Some people will tell you don't ever snap one dry fire it. It's not gonna hurt you to dry fire occasionally. Okay. You don't do it on a regular basis, but uh, after season it's the best thing to do. So, not, not all right. so if you're going to store it for a long, from one <coughs> season to the next, go ahead and dry fire. That's right. Are, is it okay to dry fire a rim fire rifle? <laughs> it's not good. Okay. It's not good because uh, sometimes that firing pin will hit your edge of your barrel and uh, and and dull the firing pin. Okay. Now good. a center fire is different. Good to know. A center fire is different. Good question, Dudley. Hmm. Yeah, and the goal is, you know, um, when we go hunting and we get out there um, and we get a big deer in front of us, so we get a big turkey in front of us, we want our gun to work. And so, you know, uh, to, to do that, you do got to have maintenance on it. You do got to do uh, different things. And, and as you shoot your gun, it wears out just like vehicles wear out. Parts wear out in a gun just the same, according to how much you shoot it. Um, there, there's a, a pile of guns that that come in and, and are mainly from duck hunting, but a lot of turkey hunt and deer hunting when you're out in the rain, your action tubes and your shotguns, they get full of muddy water. Right. And your magazine tubes get full of muddy water. Well, that sits in there and rust. Well, then your gun won't operate. And, and you know, a lot of people think all you can do is rinse out your gun and oil it. But <clears throat> is, in my opinion, once a year, you need to have it um, totally stripped down and clean, whether you do it yourself, whether you bring it to us, take it to anybody. And it does need to be stripped down completely and, and totally gone through because them the little things like that, the rust setting up, it's going to keep your gun from operating. And then you get out there and you get a big turkey in front of you and it, and it, and it does not shoot. Mm. And, um, and that, that can be a letdown to anybody. For we sure. Are, yeah, you know, and, these, and duck guns probably are the worst. Because oh, we are hunting in some rough conditions. Right. Usually. Well, I mean, like in turkey hunting, uh, I know on public land you have to keep your – firearm in a case at all times yeah um so you're taking it out in the woods on a humid humid morning might get a little rain on it right. and then you set it in your case yeah. yeah and then you go to the office you know some of us forget to uh, bring it inside we lock our doors and leave it in the case and it sits out in the heat that can't be good no no i tell you something else we run into uh taking these guns down and cleaning them you wouldn't believe what you find inside of one. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, Sometimes it's a it's an expelled primer that is blown out. They don't know it, and and it'll be rifle or shotgun, either one, be down in there. Bird feathers is real common. Oh yeah, and that'll cause you a problem. And then little trash and debris, you know what you get. So all these things can cause you a problem. When's the last time you broke your shotgun down completely and cleaned it, Toxie? Mm, yesterday. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask him that. 
Uh, fascinating that you said someone's gun failed a fairly new one and it was rusty inside the firing pin. That's right. So that's my question. How do you get in there and and get that clean? I mean, I, I definitely have never taken my firing pin out. It, it's d difficult. Uh, I don't mm. think an individual should strip those things. Right. To start with, the uh, main spring in there is about 100 pounds of pressure. Right. If you that thing can't shoot that pin out of there and stick it in something. I mean, it right. really can. And uh, you have to be cautious about it. I don't think the individual, most individuals can't do it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know how, fine. But if you don't, you better take it to somebody that does. So if you are you break down what is simple right there, and I think yeah. I watched somebody one time, yeah. maybe it was Tony, but he had like a little bit of a spray. Yeah. And it, I, maybe in gasoline, I can't remember. But he was had a little teeny little air spray thing that was – spraying and then kind of cleaning it without having to take it apart almost. You know, it's almost like a teeny tiny pressure washer thing. So maybe you could use that. <clears throat> I was wondering if you got some of the lubricant at the firing pin and then the one time, you know, snap it off, maybe one time to put it up, maybe that would, that movement might help. Well, it might. Now, the only thing about, about spraying it like you're talking about, you, you don't find things inside that, uh, that you that you can't see, right? And uh, that'll that'll help, and that will that does uh, that's better than nothing by far. But a gun really need if you want to depend on it to work, it really needs to be stripped and and gone through and checked out and uh, parts inspected, the adjustments. And go ahead. Well, the other thing I was going to ask you about too that's a problem for me. It continues on and on. It's just humidity down here, and yeah. no matter what we do. So, what is your recommendation for dehumidifying a gun safe? Because that's a big problem, especially down here. Well, in a gun safe, you need a dehumidifier in there. You can get these these little the electric, mm -hmm. you know, put them in there, and that keeps the moisture out. Mm -hmm. That's the best thing you can do. I had a doctor recently that brought me ten or twelve high dollar guns that were in terrible shape. Wow. He'd put them in a safe. He didn't realize this would happen. He thought it was okay in that safe. And they had rusted like you would believe. Mm. I had to refinish the outside of a lot of them. They, they were just blue steel. And inside it was the guy in there and, uh, and I, said, I said, look doc, you need a dehumidifier, he said, can I get just an individual? I said, yeah, I'll buy you one. I'll get you one. I already bought an electric one and, and told him. I said, you put it in there and check your temperature occasionally to be sure everything's still working. And he's never had any problems since. Mm, yeah. That's great. But it, so it really, what happens if you get a little rust on the barrel? I mean, I remember yeah. once upon a time, and yeah. my brother Bob Dixon was great, gunsmith himself from handling them for so long and selling them. But... He, he was saying use super fine steel wool Correct. It was, and it'd be very, very, very light with it. But Correct. I'm wondering too is the, what's the, oh, I got to just use some this morning, the spray. To, WD-40? Yeah, or what's the one for rust that you can break a CL Break whatever. free? No, but come on. PB Blaster? That's it. PB Blaster, would <laughs> yeah. that help? Oh yeah, that does get rid of rust better. Yeah, so. it does. We, we, use a, uh, we use a formula called Blue Wonder. Yeah, um, I've heard of that. We also sell it in, in really. We'll put, we'll put it on the gun, um, even in the barrels, and wipe it with brushes, um, and and with, in the outside with fine steel wool. That is correct, and um, wipe it down real good. Let it set a few minutes. Wipe it off, and then uh, with an oily cloth, that'll usually remove every bit of the rust. That's right. So and, all all oils aren't created equal, are they? I that's mean, right. I, no. I mean, I, I've always heard WD forty is not something you want to put on. It, the gun. It's not other than a that are cleaning on the surface, it's okay. But yeah. do not spray it on the inside. And a, and a lot of people think you spray your gun full of oil. That, that is not correct. Um, you want a light coat of oil in your gun because a heavy coat of oil, a lot of oil, all that does is something for debris to stick right. to. Right, yeah. And so, you know. So what would be, what, what brand or what type of oil to spray down the inside? Now, what we use rim oil. Okay. It's, what, it's what we use. We use Remington oil. It's been around forever. It's been around yeah. forever. We put a light coat once we get through cleaning it on that, the inside. That's one of the best that's ever worked out for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I, I've been using this stuff called CLP. Yeah. And uh, cleans, lubricates, and protects. It, and it was developed by some guns. It does. We, we've uh, 
Mac Mossley Oaks got a relationship with those folks, but uh, I got some. Lanny, I think uh, yeah, you have some, too. It's so you like stuff. that, too? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like good. that. It's CLP. Good. Uh, it's good. Good, good stuff. So it's good. I wanted to, well, Pat, we haven't forgot about you. We're yeah. going to get to you now, so hang on. <laughs> but it kind of came to my, I remember, I'm, I'm hoping some, this will help somebody. <clears throat> my daughter, taking her hunting all these years, sometimes you, I never I never slowed down and explained to her, you know, if you ever drop this, if, if God forbid, you ever dropped your rifle in the mud, you need to, you shotgun. don't need to, don't shotgun need to shoot her shotgun either. Yeah. So when she started Getting ready to go hunting on herself, I started trying to think about things that I wish I had made sure I taught her, and I thought about that. And now I have totally explained that to her. But there, there might be young people here that have never considered that if you drop a shotgun barrel down in the mud by accident, and it, you, you definitely, you have got to stop everything and clean that out. Yes, I, I, excuse me, I've probably got twenty-five uh, short pieces of barrels I've cut off where the barrel has been ruptured. From being plugged up, yeah, and I've had a guy injured from it. Yes, uh, he crossed over a beaver dam and he fell and shoved his gun in there. It's a grown man now, and he fired it to clear clear the barrel. Oh my gosh! Mm. And a piece of that uh, barrel came off and went through his cap. And he thought he thought it hit his brain. He started bleeding like crazy, and just peeled him about six inches back. Just peeled his scalp. Wow, well, he was lucky. <laughs> so, so let me ask this too. I, and again, I think this came back from Bob, but he said even a partially, you know, you you do that and you're in a hurry and <clears throat> you're turkey hunting, especially whatever yeah. duck hunting, and you just run a stick through there or whatever, and you you know clear it out and look down the barrel. It looks like I can see down there, even if it's partially obstructed, it can cause a big problem. You have to have a completely mm -hmm. clean, right? I tell you what, Winchester did on tests that they did. They did some extensive tests. They stretched a spider web. Wow. Now, this is documented. This is not junk. Stretched a, di a spider web over a shotgun barrel and taped around it to hold it steady and fired it, and it ruptured the barrel. Wow. It didn't blow it up, but it split it by about three inches. Wow. Spider so, wheel. yeah, wow. if you drop that barrel in the mud out there, you need to look and make sure you get all of that mud out. Absolutely. All of it, not just... Yeah. Where you can see through a little bit. That's right. Yes. I'll, I'll add to that a little bit because I've been through this um, with Hayden. Uh, dropped his rifle, and we were talking about cleaning the barrel out. Of course, unloaded, opened the bolt, yeah. uh, and cleaned the barrel out. Uh, yeah. And we had to push some of it out through the chamber. Yeah. <clears throat> and then uh, we went straight hunting. Yeah. And guess what? There was a piece of dirt in the firing pan. So, <laughs> yeah. of course, Mood yeah. Grande steps out <laughs> and... Dry fire. Mm -hmm. Is that so, right? yeah, when you clean that mud up, be sure to check yeah. uh, the end of your bolt, wherever your firing pin mechanism is, too, because even cleaning it out, it can get in there. And mm -hmm. Yeah, you'd have to turn it where that opening is yeah. facing down, yeah. and gravity would yeah. take it right. But still, you know, if you if it happens in the field, I'm not sure I could be comfortable enough mm -hmm. that I could clean a rifle barrel out good enough with a stick from nature or something. You don't have anything with yeah. you to do that. It's yeah. tougher uh, than a shot. Yeah. yeah. We I mean, used a stick and it didn't work. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would just recommend to most people don't do it. I you would know, come home. Yeah. Safety, safety is the number one thing. Oh my gosh. Nothing's Always. worse than breaching safety. Yeah, that's right. So if, if you don't have a safe, what, what's a proper way to store a firearm, uh, over, you know, over the year? Buy a safe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that you do. And what do, are some don'ts to yeah. as well? One thing that you do not want to do is store them in a in a case that's got the sheepskin lining in there. Right. That will create major problems. That's that's kind of what I was hoping you would say. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. I, I know because we've been there. Uh -uh. And and I don't have all answers to gun stuff. That I never pretend to. But I got a lot of them. Mm -hmm. You, you and, want them in an area that is as dry as possible. Uh, you want to continue to wipe them down. Um, and, and even in a safe with a dehumidifier, uh, you want to take your guns out and wipe them down. Okay. How, often, how often do you say? Um, I would say if, if you've got them in a safe and, and um, uh, for the year mm -hmm. uh, and you got a dehumidifier, right. I would say a couple times that year. Yeah. I would take them out, yeah. wipe them down, put them back in, and, um, because everything fails. Yeah. Um, and, and you don't want a, a nice gun to... To get messed up because and all you had to do is take it out and wipe it. I know what I'm adding to my list of house chores and gardening and 
whatever running a bush hog this weekend. I guarantee you, I'm it's going through my gun safe all yeah. weekend. Too. Every time I open my <laughs> safe, I, I check that little dehumidifier bar and make yeah. sure it's warm. Yeah, you know because it it may go out or something. That's right. Oh, yeah. That's right. So how important is it? I think I fall into this category. I'm not running a like at the end of deer season. I'm not running a patch through there to leave a little light film yeah. on the inside of my barrel. How bad am I messing up? Well, it could get rust yeah. in there. Get rust in your chamber and rust in your barrel, and then um, uh, and if you catch it in time, it's not, it's not bad. But if you don't, it'll it'll pit. Mm-hmm. And once your barrel starts pitting and your chamber start pitting, then then you got a major problem. You got a problem. And so um, yeah, that's when 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 we clean a gun, we also do that. We we leave a, a thin lining of oil in the barrel and in the chamber because uh, that 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 stops that rust. To, you know. Can you see that pitting when you look? If you look down through there with uh, your we have eye? a lot. We have a little light uh, with a mirror on it that we can put in the barrel. Sometimes it's really hard to see the pitting. Now, if it's in the chamber where you can get a flashlight on it and look pretty good, but um, it's sometimes it's hard when it gets gets down in the barrel to see it. The older um, the gun, the more likely it is to be an yes, issue. Yes, yes, correct. Uh, what about choke tubes? How do you uh, install uh, and? Uh, I've cut so many choke tubes off barrels because <laughs> they will not. Take them out at the end of season, clean them and oil them and put them back on. Mm-hmm. Do you and, use a special oil for that? Uh, I got a I got a thin grease that I that I usually use to put them back in. Made for um, that. It's made for that. And and um, but there's I mean I got one in the gun shop right now that, that won't come off. And and um, a, a lot of times I can get them out, but a lot of times I got to cut off the barrel and rethread them for chokes. And 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 all it took was when you got through hunting, unscrew it. Clean the rust off of it, put that light grease in it, and put it back in there, and, and, and you're good. I got and chewed old, out by a gunsmith one time because of that. <laughs> <laughs> and an old toothbrush is ideal to clean those threads. Okay. Mm-hmm. Use your little solvent. Now, we clean with uh, kerosene. Right. The reason for that is it's a little bit of an oil in it. Not heavy, but it's a little oil. Some of these solvents you clean with, I let one rust up something terrible. Yes. Mm-hmm. But we clean with kerosene. Okay. But you take an old toothbrush and brush those threads real well, dry them, and put a little of this. You got a choke tube grease. Put it on there and screw it back. You won't ever have one stick. Mm. Nope. I bet my stuck right now. It probably is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would lose it to, if it's not. I. You're yeah. lucky. I'd lose it to be sure. Yeah. I check that too. I got a long list of things to do. <laughs> The Furminator is the industry's most versatile piece of food plot equipment, allowing plotters to do every step of the process, working the soil, adding seed and soil supplements, and compacting. From start to finish, with a single implement, it's hassle-free by design. Set it for the seed size and simply drive the tractor, and the Furminator does the rest. Check it out at theferminator.com. Hey guys, Dudley from Gamekeepers here. I want to tell you about the all-new Gunner Dog Bowl. It's designed for home and built for travel. It's customizable, leak-resistant, light on weight, solid on durability, and rust-proof. Like other Gunner products, they're made in Nashville and designed for everywhere. Hey, Pat, I'd like you to jump in here. Is everything we're saying making sense? You got anything else to add? Yeah, you know, we we take the process from, you know, the dirtiest gun you can imagine when we're trying to re-decorate it, and we go through the same process, right? The yeah. cleaner the the starting point, the better the finish will come out. And, you know, it is right, right? We use brake cleaner because we have access to it, and that gets everything off of it and leaves it dry with no residue on it. So, you know, this is this is great information, and we, we go through the same steps before we start decorating a firearm so so yeah the big question is for you to let us all know is though most of the people listen to this you know turkey hunters especially the waterfowl hunters most of them are mm-hmm. using a dipped gun you know and, yeah. and recognize pat in front of everybody he's one of the pioneers of that yeah. whole industry yeah, the whole we're so lucky here. to have him as our partner and our brother here but what do you do do you just ignore it i've kind of heard you know that's coming from you or coming from the gunsmith people it's like just throw a light coating or whatever you're using on the gun on there or you know one thing it does do it does help so much to protect the gun compared to just leaving it you know the blue and yeah. exposed but what do you recommend for the surfaces because you know some of it's on synthetic some of it's on wood but some yeah. of it's on the metal 
Yeah, and it, you know, it is a it is a, a full coating, right? So we start from the bare metal or the bare plastic, and we're putting a coating down and then putting the decoration, the film on it. And then we're also applying a clear top coat to that, same that you would have on your car. And in that, the only difference in what we've been talking about is what you do to the finish after you've cleaned your gun. And we don't put oil on it. We don't put anything on the outside. We just we just wipe it down after we've finished cleaning the inside of our gun. But in the example, if you drop your gun in the mud or you're duck hunting and it's really dirty, we start with just uh, Dawn dish soap and some warm water and get all the dirt off of it. Because the only thing that really causes a problem is standing fluid. And that can be water, it can be too much oil, it can be any of those that are standing on the part after you get done cleaning it. So we want to make sure everything is removed from a puddling perspective. So that's why you don't spray oil in the receiver down the barrel so that it can run down. Yeah. But we just use Dawn soap and, and warm water, get all the dirt off of it to where it's clean. And then we just towel it dry um, and wipe it down. We don't put oil on it because that oil, depending on or uh, depending on what it is, can also make the gun shinier, the finish shinier, because it's actually staying on top of the clear coat that we've applied. And that clear coat has solvent resistance, abrasion resistance. It really is an envelope around the, the, the gun, the barrel, the stock um, that helps protect it from the environment. It just, you gotta remove the contaminants because that's where everything starts. That's where your rust starts. It's in between those particles and the metal or the plastic that is causing that um, degradation of the coating, so. Good to know, I'm great so, info. I tell you, it makes a gun look so good. It does. And, and, you know, and a gun is a tool. You're out there trying to hunt, hunt turkeys, hunt ducks, and you don't need that thing. In the old days, those beautiful blue guns with the really pretty wood, I mean, people used to, you know, really look how pretty my gun is. But that's a thing of the past, really. Uh, I don't when know it comes about to, that. When I like it comes both. to hunting. Well, like we're both. talking about killing stuff. Though. I like I mean, my not, shiny A5 a, sometimes, not, and then I like my camo dip gun I don't sometimes. like anything shiny yeah. in the turkey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I love the... the the dip <clears throat> process too because it adds layer protection to my gun in the first yes. place. Oh, it has. It's yes. as rough as I am on stuff. And you don't even have to be rough. I mean, the sodium that's in your in your hand. Yeah. Yes. When you touch a blue barrel, if you don't wipe it off, it's going to be fingerprints there. Yeah. yeah. And right. you don't have that with uh, with the dip. Yeah. So, yeah. Pat, are all the dips kind of cre uh, created equal? Is there some a little more durable than others? You know, we've the technology is as we recognize has been around for a long time, and that's really what we do is, is spend time working on these coatings, uh, not only for the OEMs that are um, selling the guns and producing them um, in their manufacturing environment, but we're working on the coatings to help improve that. So as long as you um, put the right mill thickness, and that is the thickness of the coating that the film goes to, and then the thickness of the coating that's clear, the clear is over the top. As long as you get the mill thickness, most of the coatings have been designed to have some solvent resistance to it, abrasion resistance, and then obviously the, the lack of sheen comes from the coating itself. So probably 20 years ago, maybe it wasn't as um, uh, effective coating because those coatings we brought out of the automotive industry and tailored them to the firearms industry. Hmm. And that's still what we do today. We've been working on coatings for a couple of years now that are a firearms coating package to look at the environment that they're used in, how they're put away in the gun safe, what do they come up against putting it in your gun case when you're turkey hunting and back and forth and in and out. So we're trying to improve not only the durability of those coatings, but the, the environmental resistance that they have to the weathering. So a guy could take it. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of uh, decorators around that's basically mm -hmm. about the best word I think to describe it yeah. but you could take an old gun to one of these guys and probably for a couple of hundred bucks make oh, it yes. turn into a what looks like a brand new gun couldn't you Pat? Mm -hmm. It does I mean it, it is night and day as if you guys have recognized it takes an old gun that could be uh, rusted or the scratches on the stock and once we um, prep it to be decorated it looks brand new when it's finished um, it, it is just like it came out of the factory again. You know, I think one point, Bobby, it's like for the cost of dipping, which it is the technology is just amazing and how far, there's so many more benefits to having this process on your gun than just putting mossy oak on it. It really is. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad we talked about it and let him talk about mm -hmm. today. I honestly, I mean, not being the most disciplined, uh, this will help me a lot today. I think having a lot of dip guns has saved me 
Mm-hmm. Taking care of the gun, one hundred percent for me. I yeah. know it has for me. So yeah. it's just so much more benefit to it. In fact, some of these finishes even have that you know that touch that's so nice it has a little grip to it. Yeah, I think Browning's does. Browning it, does. It, it's, yep. that's there may be others. Okay. Tell us about those real quick. Yeah, so that's what they would refer to as a soft touch type of coating, and it it is a it is an additive that goes into the clear coat. Um, that the gun's been uh, the final coating on the gun that is almost like a rubber component and it gives it that soft non-slip. You can do that somewhat with texture too, but that really that tactile feel that you have is coming from the additive that's in the clear coat. And you can do it in solid colors too. So if you just decorated the stock and forearm and you wanted to spray it on the metal components, you could get that same tactile feel from that. And it, it's as durable as long as you don't um, add too much of anything into that coating, the properties of that coating uh, will stay as designed. And that's, again, back to the solvent resistance, abrasion resistance, and the weatherability of it. Talk to you, have you ever leaned a gun against a tree and gone and lusted on your turkey and oh then gosh. turned around and not be able to find your gun? So I have one, I have one dipped like 22, and uh, this has been 10, 12 years ago. I had it, had it and... Um, I was on in the, during the holidays, Christmas holidays, and I decided not to get up and go deer hunting. I just went sneaking around, and we were in Alabama, and it's not you know it's easy to find ducks down there, but we got a few places. And I was slipping around looking for, you know, I had the gun just in case I might decide to go squirrel hunting, and I actually did for a little while. Um, I might see a hog, you know. I just had my twenty two with me, and so I leaned it up on a tree, and eased up and crawled up because I wanted to get up there and see what was going on with these ducks. There were some there. I could hear some quacking, which is kind of rare. And so my absent mind itself um, was so excited. I found a pretty good mini and came out and got back to the truck where they had a golf cart and got back out. And I realized I just left my gun laying up on a tree and I, I couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> and so I tell that this is what threw me off. I got back in the truck and left and then remembered it maybe 30 minutes later. And so I just, in my mind, it was sitting on that little gun rack in my golf cart I had there. And I went back and it was gone. This is real close to houses in a road there. And I just, and I went back and looked everywhere and I could not find it. And I just finally assumed someone stole it off the four wheeler because I couldn't remember any different, you know, sorry to say. About three years ago, Neil goes, Dad, what's with this? I found the 22. It was leaning up on a tree. And it you can't even move the bolt. It's completely ruined. So wonder, it was dipped. Well, let's, yes. let's take that one to Mr. Sanders there. We'll let him work. No, I don't think you're going to save that one. It's been in the weather for 12 years. Yeah. Uh, Pat, so do you That's want hilarious. us to give out a, an email address, or do you have a website or something? Do you want people to be able to contact you about things? About no, guns? Yeah, for technical support, you can just – give them my email address and we'd be happy to walk them through. And, and obviously, Bobby, as you mentioned, we have uh, literally hundreds of these decorators that you called them throughout the United States that do an excellent job for the consumers out there to have their guns either re-dipped or uh, in a different pattern or start with the black gun and have it dipped too. And we have, we have all access to that. So if they just want to reach out to us, we can get them close to the, the decorator in their state and, and have them, uh, contact them directly. Sweet. Yeah, that sounds good. Everything's better in bottom line. I, I think I, we. Well, I think we've all learned a little something. Oh, I know. Yeah. yeah, I know. Look, I got a lot of work to do. Yeah, don't let us start winding down. I have a question when you get to that. Yeah, yeah no, I, got no, one, I got one. I got one more yeah, question yeah. too. So, uh, <clears throat> Pat, thank you. Yeah, you you've been, you, but don't don't leave now. But yeah. go, Thanks, go okay. ahead. Go ahead, Lane. You want to go first? No, go okay. ahead. Uh, just your opinion on uh, the most reliable shotgun that was ever made. <laughs> Oh, man. That's... Be a single shot something. Yeah, that's right. I don't be. know. It's hard to beat the Browning A5. Browning A5. Yeah. Yeah. Really I love is. it. That, that Bobby thing, loves a Browning yeah. A5. Yeah. That Browning A5 will shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. I got, one, shoot. I, I got one I bought in 69. Cost me $125. 59, excuse me. 59. Cost me $125. And uh, my wife at the time said, I can't believe a gun's that expensive. <laughs> yeah. And uh, several years ago, I still got the same old gun, but I've taken care of it. Several years ago, I had it at the shop. I'd cleaned it and uh, 
was I didn't lay it down on the counter and a guy come in and says, Hey gun for sale? I said, No. He said, Whose is it? I said, Mine. He said, I give you five hundred for it. I said, No, you won't. He said, I'll give you six. And she walked in about that time. <clears throat> I said, Remember this old gun in the vault? And she said, Yeah, I said, You said it's the most expensive gun you ever saw? Yeah. He said, I'll give you seven. <laughs> <laughs> she said, you go sell it to him? I said, no. <laughs> I've had that gun since I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> no. And so uh, boys are going to end up with it. Yeah. That's awesome. What a, same question for got, rifles. Great story. Oh, great story. Uh, and I'll tell it quick, Mr. Fox story. story. Yeah. yeah. Daddy bought a gun that was ridiculous at the time in the 60s, but it was like 500 and and he got a Zeiss claw mount scope with it for like 500 and something dollars. It was a German drilling. Yeah. But the point real quick was he was like, Mama just chest. We had not have $500 to spend on it. What do you do? And she just chastised him. And he was like, all my friends have one. And every one of them that have bought one, it turned out to be a great investment. She said, no, it's not an investment. He said, yes, it is. It's worth more one year after that. She said, it's not an investment unless you're willing to sell it. He was quiet for a minute. He said, Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good, good point. point. Good point. Well, tell you what what they do appreciate. That's the point. Yeah. But it's also, it's a little telling about Mr. Fox that he would come home and tell Miss Evelyn that I bought this gun. Because a lot well, of she guys. she had the checkbook. She's a, she was a well, CFO. It wasn't any hiding anything from A her. lot of guys <laughs> would slide it under the bed and, <clears throat> and never say anything. I always say, look what I bought for you. <laughs> yeah, look, I got nope. you a new shotgun. <laughs> There's no secrets with my mom. <laughs> so ask your question about a rifle, Lanny. Oh, just the same thing of, of what you would consider one of the most reliable uh, rifles. Uh, the old Remington, Remington bolt action. Or the Winchester, Winchester Model 70. Yes, sir. And yeah. uh, and that Remington is hard to beat. And also the Ruger M77. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, they're, they're good rifles, too. Those three, we never have any problems out of them. There you go. Yeah. Good you just enough. don't have. Yeah. Dudley, you got a question? <clears throat> I was thinking about rifles. Sorry. Yeah. So I just want to ask you one quick thing about uh, yeah. being in the gun business so long, yeah. so these 60-some-odd years. Yeah. I, it's got a. I bet you can tell when a little, when a young man or a, a young girl comes in and they're looking at those guns. I bet you can you can tell right away that they're they're gonna be a hunter. You can just tell by the way they look at them. And there's, I, I bet that's been a lot of fun through the years. Oh yeah. You yeah, had yeah. a story about Toxie coming yeah. in your store. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, he made all this up. I know he made it up. Yeah. <laughs> Him and, and, and Bill Sugg too. Oh yeah. <laughs> but oh, little yeah. little boys just sit because I've been there. Oh, I know. You oh, just, I'm, I'm there right now. Oh, it was just, like yeah, going to a miniature Disney World. Oh my gosh. Yes. And you this. and you want to touch them and. You know, right. as a child, the, those things make such an impact. You know, the other thing goes along. With that, uh, that indelible memory for me was going to like going to the bait shop. Oh yeah! Oh, oh yeah. my gosh! Get Gun worms or yeah. crickets or minnows, minnows to go minnows. fishing. Yeah. It was such a cool rite of passage, and then be able to go and look at the game, watch a guy who really knew about guns, you know, tell you about them. That was so cool. And it, at that time, I had the bait too and the crickets too. He sure did. Part of that time, he was uh, getting that. <clears throat> Hey, y'all yep. need to kick that back off. You know, I live right out there. That'd be real convenient. <laughs> it's not far from landing. <laughs> Nosler is known for their bullets, and now they're making suppressors. Nosler suppressors are made for hunting. Adding a Nosler suppressor to your rifle will make you a quieter, more accurate, and more effective hunter. Protect your hearing and disturb less game with a Nosler suppressor. The time to hunt quiet is now. Learn more at Nosler.com. Hey, this is Toxie Hayes with Mossy Oak. You know, hunting and fishing, game keeping, and taking care of the land with my family is my life. And I'll be honest with you, the one app that I'm on every day and use more than anything is on X. It literally has changed my life. From property ownership to roads, everything to do with understanding the land better. I even use it to plot acreages all the time. Every function I could dream of. Use coupon code Mossy Oak to save 20% on your next on X subscription. Trust me, you'll be so glad you did. Okay, here's my one thing I gotta ask him about because, uh, and it's a little bit of a change of pace, but it's right up his alley. Um, so, you know, today's turkey hunter has changed so much. And part of, and Dr. Chamberlain said, part of the problem is we've got too many tools and we're too efficient killers now. Mm. And we're just killing too many. And I'm not, not to get off on a, 
a tangent or a sermon about that. But we have the new shotgun loads that have improved and improved now TSS, and that's a whole nother level. We have the choke tubes, and we have the guns. We each have the red dots and all the sights. I mean, all these things have improved. And so I'm all for, just like in archery, anything that makes us more accurate, uh, as long as we're not, you know, pushing that too far. But here's the one thing I think I need, and I just asked about the other day, got a little information, is I think I need a better trigger. Just like we, yeah. you, in my quick story, it was years, 10 years ago, Mr. Fox was giving up on hunting. He'd missed like three or four deer in a row, and he said, I just can't, he was giving, he was pitiful. I can't do this, I can't do this. Well, he was wanting to shoot because of his shoulder and all this little 243 Remington pump. That's just what he insisted on. So, the 760 and, or the 7600. Yeah, I and so, you know, Gary Davis, you know, worked for us and w- sat with him, you know, close friend for a long uh-huh. time. He'd sit with him a lot and he watched him miss some. I watched him. He was just going to give up. And Gary said, Let me pull that trigger. It's like, Oh my gosh. And it was like eight and a half or nine pounds. Does that sound right? That's right. Brought you that gun. Did. And it's knocked it, whatever, <laughs> fixed it. I don't know what you did, but it was about two pounds. Yeah. And he never missed another deer for about six or eight years. Yeah. In fact, I don't think he ever missed another one after that. Yeah. So <clears throat> I've had, yes, the last three years, just turkeys, gun on my knee. Dead. And sometimes I'm hyperventilating and having to, take a shot in the brush or something, but I'm starting to miss turkeys. And even when I sight the gun in and I shoot left-handed and that makes me, when I'm pulling, it pulls to the right, no matter what, unless I put it in something. Don't they make triggers for shotguns? Cause I, I'd ask about it. And one of my really good friends is Rodney. He's a competition shooter, likes to, he said, oh yeah, people put, is that Timney triggers and stuff like that on their shotguns, competition shooters. Is that something you could do? Oh, yeah. We do a lot of them. Now, some guns are not available for. Right. But some of the guns, we can alter what's mm. there. Like on your dad's gun, I just altered it. Yeah, that was a rifle. Yeah, I want to right. get a better trigger. Because, I mean, for him, on turkeys, that's part of the problem. Yeah. For the world out there, we, we actually got him out this year yeah. in a Polaris Ranger. Those things are incredible, the EVs. Yeah. And just eased him up and backed into some a, a hedgerow and blinded up and actually just going through the motion because that, that way you, didn't, you couldn't get him out, couldn't get him on the ground. Yeah. And I, I put a ratchet strap across between those uh, bars in the front yeah. <laughs> where he could just sit there like a shooting house. Yeah. And by Jingo's, we ended up making a turkey gobble and calling a turkey up. And he shot, and you could see because it was a plowed field, they were getting ready to plant. And I could see the dust fly. He missed twice, sadly. Mm. But the great news is he didn't. It was so close, but he pulled the gun both times. And I, yeah, you know, yeah. I got that yeah. gun. It's a little bitty 20 gauge. And I put, man, that trigger's so hard to pull. Well, at his state, he's 94. That's going to cause him to miss every time. It takes everything he can to pull that trigger. I'm, so that's my question is that yes. could you get a good safe trigger that's not quite so hard to pull on a shotgun? Yes. yes. I'm yes. going to offline go have a visit with him <laughs> and schedule an appointment for my turkey yeah, so gun. So you, you got all different type of – because mm-hmm. some of the shotguns, they don't make triggers for, that's but right. they may make a trigger spring kit that we right. can put in right. uh, or, or even work on the hammer and the sear uh, that's in the trigger and hammer that's there. And so – uh, we we can help it tremendously yeah, yeah. Uh, one way or the other. I just yeah. want to say nobody out there try to mess with a trigger no. ever of any gun no, of any no. type, no matter who told you what to do, and you, take it to a trained professional. Yeah, you're I've, exactly right. I've had my 870 and my 7600 pump trigger improved. Yeah. Wow, both yeah. of them. Yeah. So, Mr. It's, Sanders, wouldn't you say? I mean, you've been at this a long time. Triggers have that. It's because of lawyers and liability uh, right. that, that these gun manufacturers have increased the pressure on their triggers. That's exactly years. right. And a, a lot of gunsmiths will not adjust one at all. Now, we do. We've never had a problem. I test it thoroughly. And like his dad's gun now, it was about two-pound pull. But I said, look, caution Mr. Fox now well about this. Right. This thing is light. Don't touch that trigger to get ready to shoot. Yeah. And uh, but that's that's exactly the reason. never had an issue. Just as crisp and yeah. perfect, and you mm-hmm. know, yeah. trigger is so important. The Europeans have got it figured out. All these set triggers that yeah, they do. That's right. I mean, they understand what's going on. Yeah. But 
We've just never done that over yeah. here. I love well, I understand a good set you, trigger. Yeah, you never want to get a trigger so, you know, it's not safe. Either. That's right. You know, but I know that it, surely it can be less to pull because, honestly, if you have a turkey with the TSS and these choke tubes that, you know, kill one rock dead at 50 or maybe further even, if you get a turkey at 20 yards and you're going to shoot him in the head, it is so easy to pull. You, mm -hmm. You're you're almost shooting a rifle. That's right. Oh, yeah. No, that's so right. I just, you know, you don't want a trigger so easy to pull it. it's not safe. But I'm my only point about bringing it up, you might think about that on your gun if, yeah. you, if it's really hard to pull the trigger. Yeah. The shotgun ought to be three or four pounds. Yeah. And y'all uh, y'all slicked up my son's uh, single shot handy rifle. Okay. Uh, it was it was about nine pounds, and it's 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 at about three and a half or four yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Right. No, that's good. And, and the thing about it, uh, a man may not realize that in his younger years, but as you get older, ditto. It, it makes a lot of difference now. I resemble that one. It, I mean, it does. Your hands are not as strong, and and you don't pull quite as smooth as you used to as a as a kid. So when you get older, it makes a difference. Yeah. I bet you own wing shooting, Bobby does and ducks i mean if if people as good at shooting as clay or rodney and that group are putting specialized triggers on their guns then i need one too mm -hmm. that <laughs> makes i'm sense. not nearly as good a shot as they are pat you got anything to add to that no that was i do work on all my triggers as well um just because the you know the drop test required like you mentioned bobby for the for the lawyers it's got to be over eight pounds to pass that test, so we don't really have a choice. That's the way they ship from the factory. So, yeah. and it is a huge advantage. Yeah, I would. I, the, my vote would be trigger would be the first thing I would improve on a on a firearm. Yep. Over any other mod. Yeah. Amen. Yep. And Toxie made a great point. Just want to stop and make sure everybody hears that. Never don't do this yourself. No, no, no. Right. And don't do it yourself. You know, or buy a new trigger. That's what I was interested in. Yeah. Some, there's some companies make a great trigger that don't yes. do anything but make triggers. Yeah, yeah. Lanny, so are you, you listening to You can get this? one of those. Don't just necessarily try to change the one you have. Yeah. And leave that to a, a gunsmith to decide for you. Yeah, Lan I'm making sure Lanny heard it because he's the type that would get an Allen set out and yeah. get to working on it. Yeah. I, I can do this can myself. Say, yeah. Lanny? I've only, I've only done it a couple times, okay? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh, man. Never again. Well, what else is there? What did we learn? Lots. I yeah, really there's, a, I, there's a lot I need to be doing that I'm not doing in my yes, guns. Yeah, my sure. I leave a lot to be desired. Yeah, me too. Yep. I learned my wife may be <laughs> sleep deprived because all those uh, symptoms that he mentioned. Headache. And and, and, and and aggressiveness. And, <laughs> right, whatever. Yeah, I mean, now, <laughs> oh, I'm going to make sure Mel listens <laughs> to this. Yeah, let me call <laughs> Melissa. Yep, yep. Call she, Melissa. she doesn't listen, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe she will on this one. We'll be sure she does. Mr. Sanders, it's been a pleasure yeah, to see you and have you. Really, really good. And, you know, he is a he is a part of this whole have, history of because he was yes. there. You know, I'm 64 now. As a little kid, he was an icon of mm -hmm. guns then, and he still is. It's really no cool doubt. to see you around. Well, before you came in, he said, I remember, he said, Toxie's mom would bring him in my shop, and he said, he, she couldn't get him to leave. He was telling <laughs> telling the story about you. It's <laughs> like the parts store is kind of the same, or, the, you know, the, just like the gunsmith. Oh, I loved it. Always got some retired guy in there hanging out, and it, well, you know, so, it's always so, a good yeah, vibe. Big you know? part of our culture here, it really is. Even one of my first memories was my dad taking by there. Would always trade guns with you know everybody, mm -hmm. bring something in and give you some boot. Is what yeah. they call it. Yeah. Put some boot on the table, yeah. and we'll get something done. Yeah. So. so let me tell this. So you know, I've been here twenty nine years now, but but after I wrote the dummy line, uh -huh. I got a little handwritten note from Mr. Ed Sanders. I didn't know him at all, but I got a little handwritten note saying that he had read that book and how much he enjoyed it. I did God. love it. How about that? Love that. Yeah. That's and, and I had never met you at that yeah, point, and that, right. made me, that kind of was our introduction. So. That's right. It was good. I enjoyed his books. Oh, you're a turkey hunter, aren't you? A little bit. Not not really good anymore. I don't I don't have much of a turkey anymore. Can't get around as well as I should. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I had an interesting thing guy. Uh, a while back, I had a fella came in and never done any business with him. He said, uh, I hear you're a world-famous gunsmith. I said, man, I don't know about that. And he said, uh, they tell me you're the best. I said, I don't know about that either. I never said that. And he said, well, are you good? I said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, how good? He said, your card kind of makes it brag. I said, what does that card say? He says, good is the best, better than most. I said, I stick to that. 
<laughs> he said, prove it. I said, you prove I'm not. <laughs> he said, I said, I never said I'm the best. I'm as good as the best, better than most. He said, okay, I'll leave it there. I said, well, that's the way I leave it. <laughs> I, <laughs> I love it. I made yeah. a brag and say yeah. I know all about him. No, if a man says I know all about a particular subject, he's lying. Yeah. Mm. He don't. Yeah, for he may, sure. He no, it does not. So, Brooks, you're going to be taking over the gunsmithing business. You're the grandson there. Yeah, he's Brooks already wife. pretty much taking it over, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, and, I, and I, I learned everything I know from him. Uh, wow. It was a blessing. That's uh, so I've, cool. I haven't been to uh, gunsmithing school. Um, I just, yeah, you did. I, well, yeah. <laughs> for, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just been out the there. The school of hard knocks. <laughs> yeah. Gunsmith school. school. Yeah. And, and I can promise you it was uh, a lot uh, a lot harder than gunsmith at school. But, um, you know, I've been out there since I've been young, uh, hanging on his back pocket. Uh, I got interested in it um, and did everything I can to learn uh, what I needed to. Um, and, and I've come a long ways. Uh, I don't know everything either. Um, I still have to go to them, uh, especially on the older guns uh, uh, that's missing parts, and I don't know what they look like, and they don't have blueprints for them, and uh, he knows exactly what they look like because he, he's lived it, and um, and so that's that's great to be able to go back to that uh, and have that uh, to uh, to help my education uh, in learning these things. But it takes a long time to be a gunsmith. You don't go to gunsmith school and get out and you're a gunsmith. Yeah, no, no doubt about um, that. That just does not happen. Uh, same way with a doc doctor, you got an apprentice. And and so I've, I've been lucky to have that in my life and, and um, I'm, I've learned everything I can. I'm still learning. Uh, and I just hope that I can uh, uh, make his legacy go on until I'm gone. I think, you're, right. I think you already have. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I was tough yeah. on him. I don't mind telling you. I'd make him go back. I say, no, bud, go back and redo that. That's not acceptable. You know. If you quote, sign your name to it, saying, I did this, it's not ready. Mm -hmm. If there's one thing you would not compromise on is a gun. Yeah. In any right. form. So good for you. No, sir. They, they, good for you living through it. Good That's for right. you and being so disciplined, too. We do yeah. not do that. Well, is there a way guys can get in touch with y'all? Is there a website? Yes, so, or... yes I got a website, um, uh, Ed Sanders uh, Gun Shop. Uh, my email is edsandersgunshop uh, at gmail.com. So, we'll, we'll put all that in the show notes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, whatever I can do to help. Pat, you got anything else to add? No, sir, I'm good. Thank you. Well, we appreciate all you do. I appreciate you coming on here today. Big time. Yeah. Pat. And, uh, Super Pat, as we yeah, call him. Yeah, he is a neat guy. He can he figure sure it is. out, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, well, I'm looking around the room. This has been interesting. It has. It's a good one. It's a good very, one. Yeah, very, it very it seems like such an easy topic, but it's really, yeah, there's a lot, it's kind of, it's there's things that need to be done. It really is. Well, it's a, it's a reminder we all need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm Deadly. Guilty. Did you have anything? Uh, we get all your questions? We got it. I'm going to go home and get to work. i got to open my safe. <laughs> yeah, and, we got a lot of work to do. This I can week. beat you home. Good thing I'm right close to the shop down there. <laughs> you yeah. are. You're close. Yeah, you are. Well, why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Cleve. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.